Thank you, Caitlin. Um, anyone who knows me uh, realizes that I am not the tech wizard. Uh, and in fact, just to share a story, um, I was sitting on the sofa when my son was five years old. This was back in the era of VCRs. And the thing wasn't working. So I was trying a couple of, of uh, clicks on the, on the remote. And he said, Dad, remember, he's five years old at this point. Dad, let's get Mom. She'll know how to fix it. <laughs> so, Caitlin, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the connections. As Mark said, the, the, it's a huge topic. We're not going to talk as much tonight about the uh, connections of the autonomic nervous system in the gut or the bladder. We'll focus a lot on the orthostatic intolerance, the circulatory component, and Dr. Brinker's going to give you a very good talk on uh, the two common forms of orthostatic intolerance, neurally mediated hypotension and POTS, and then we'll hear a bit more about the interesting work that's being done here on sweating disorders. Um, Dr. G is going to talk about that. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, syncope and fainting and lightheadedness and I put these two slides up these are these two papers up because this is to remind us that it wasn't that long ago that people were writing the first case reports connecting syncope and uh, Chiari malformation so the first one was talking about syncope as a presenting feature of, uh, of Chiari uh, as was the one below from the Mayo Clinic that had only two patients I think that's uh, it's amazing to think of how far we've come in the, uh, the time since these papers came out. Uh, we've also learned that uh, you don't have to have syncope as the presenting feature. And so let me be very practical about a case uh, of, a, of a girl I saw a little over 20 years ago now. Uh, she came to see me from Gettysburg uh, because she'd been pretty healthy uh, for until she got mono at age 12. Um, and like many people with mono, she was tired for a few months afterwards, but gradually improved, but not quite back to her pre-mono level of function. Uh, by 15, she was reporting that she was tired all the time um, and would be get, get worse with virtually any increase above her usual activity. Uh, she also would get tired, more tired uh, when she went shopping. And as we teach our residents in pediatrics here, any teenager who is uh, avoiding the mall has an organic problem until proven otherwise. <laughs> so uh, she also had uh, a symptom that many in the room who've had Chiari will recognize, and that is when, when she would play her wind instruments, the fatigue would get worse. Now, when we saw her, she was lightheaded every day, especially in the shower, because that's a combination of an upright stress and a heat stress. And she would get tired standing in the, uh, her dad's uh, church choir. He was the minister at the, at the church. She had a lot of other features that we see in chronic fatigue syndrome. Her sleep was unrefreshing. She had uh, worsening of her uh, symptoms for a day or two after exceeding her limit of activity. She had arthralgias and uh, some trouble with uh, math problems. Headache at that point was only every two days. So it didn't really look like a Chiari at this point. When we examined her, she had features that a lot of you will recognize uh, if you have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. She had ve very soft skin. Uh, she had the ability to pull her upper lid way out, and, and uh, if she'd been a boy, she would have had easy eversion of the lids, but the girls never try that the way the boys do. <laughs> Um, she had this thing that uh, you see on the bottom, with, which are called pesogenic papules. These are fat pads that come through loose uh, fascial connective tissue. She had blue sclera, and her Biden score was uh, uh, almost at the maximum. And at that point, at least in my hands, and I thought I was doing a pretty careful neurologic examination, she didn't really have any abnormalities. So we did a, a, a standing test. And this showed in the black that her resting heart rate was in the normal range. But as soon as she stood, it shot way up. And in fact, she had a 55 beat increase in her heart rate. And as Dr. Brinker is going to tell you, 40 beats would be normal in an adolescent and 30 in an adult. So she far exceeded that. Plus, just standing there inc increased her fatigue, her lightheadedness, uh, her nausea, and she got a sort of a hot flash. 
So we treated her as we were doing at the time with salt and fluoronef, uh, extra fluids, mitodrins, another drug. And she was able to get to school more regularly. She was really doing better. And I thought, boy, this couldn't have been much easier. Uh, then I got a call from them saying that at the eight month point, she'd had a couple of uh, upper respiratory infections back to back. And her fatigue was much more impressive. She couldn't sleep. She had much worse headaches. Uh, and she was, again, unable to attend school. So I said, well, we've got to bring her back down. And her examination was incredibly abnormal at this point. She um, had rotatory nystagmus when we did her uh, ocular examination. She didn't have a gag reflex. Her reflexes were really brisk, now with two to three beats of clonus. Uh, and they'd been normal eight months before. So we went ahead and got an MRI, and this is still the worst MRI I've seen of somebody with Chiari malformation. You can see that she's got a retroflexed odontoid at the base here, and that, that narrows the foramen magnum even more, but her cerebellar tonsils are triangulated down. I think she was uh, 13 millimeters below the uh, the foramen magnum and she probably had some backup uh, you can see that her ventricles are a bit dilated so she eventually needed a shunt and a decompression but the point about her uh, presentation was with even with these really impressive neuroanatomic abnormalities she not had uh, classical Chiari symptoms until two months beforehand so she, she met criteria for orthostatic intolerance, and Dr. Brink will be talking more about this, but what we mean by that, for those of you who haven't encountered that term, is this is a, a term that refers to a group of clinical conditions in which symptoms worsen with quiet upright posture and are somewhat improved but not always uh, ameli or abolished by lying back down. Uh, and the two t forms of it that Dr. Brinker will teach you about more are POTS on the left and what we call neurally mediated hypotension or neurally mediated syncope on the right. The right hand slide shows a tilt test in one of our medical students here who had failed her first year because of fatigue and fainting. And uh, the black shows that her heart rate only went up about nine beats during the, the first little while on the tilt, but she was very symptomatic. And at the six minute point, she had this profound drop in blood pressure below 50 systolic. And as, she, as we brought the table back down, she had a couple of tonic clonic movements, which is not uncommon with syncope uh, in the tilt lab. So, those are the things that Dr. Brinker will talk about. Uh, one of the connections uh, that we see is that people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome also have a lot of orth orthostatic intolerance, whether they have Chiari or not. And this is a slide from a Belgian paper by Inga de Vondele, who's a superb uh, physical therapy investigator. And she just compared people with, on the left, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos uh, syndrome and the classical form. The hypermobile folks are in the darker line, so they have more orthostatic intolerance, and then more of the other autonomic symptoms you can see. Uh, and those include, I'm not sure I can even read it from here, uh, a lot of uh, sweating, GI problems, uh, gastroparesis, either diarrhea or constipation, bladder problems, uh, and others. So those are the things that are looked for on uh, some of the autonomic questionnaires. And on the right-hand part of the slide is the comparison with the healthy controls. So you can see that if you've got EDS, you're going to have a lot more of these symptoms, uh, and we'll, we'll talk uh, a little bit more about the EDS Chiari link. So this was a paper that uh, came out in early 2005 showing that you could have these problems associated with Chiari, and I thought the story was interesting. This is a 42-year-old who had progressive occipital headaches, nausea, vomiting, so some upper GI symptoms, the fatigue, which is often seen with Chiari. I think Dr. Miller described it in about 60-some percent of his Chiari series, uh, recurrent syncope several times a week, uh, and she would have palpitations and tachycardia, pallor, diaphoresis is the medical term for sweating. And so a lot of the things we're going to be talking about, this person had. And after a faint, she had several hours of fatigue, which is not at all uncommon. Uh, what they reported in that paper was that her syncopal episodes, her unsteadiness, her visual and sensory motor symptoms all disappeared after surgery and remained absent at the one-year follow-up. 
and this just shows the difference in her autonomic uh, circulatory features before surgery and after. On the left-hand slide, you can see this big increase in the heart rate in black, and then she was presyncopal, meaning almost fainting, uh, after six minutes. Whereas after surgery at the follow-up, she didn't have POTS and her blood pressure remained quite stable. So one of the things we can see is marked improvement in the autonomic symptoms after decompression. The, the ways in which Chiari and the autonomic nervous system might be linked are, uh, that have been published anyway are, one is it's thought that there's a compression of one of the arteries because intracranial pressure increases during any kind of strain or valsalva or playing the wind instrument like the first patient had. There could be some compression of the midbrain structures um, uh, that, that affect autonomic function. You could get direct compression of the cardiorespiratory centers in the, in the brain stem or other uh, autonomic pathways. And then Dr. Henderson's um, been very interested in this notion that deformative strain, too much bending or strain in the uh, uh, brainstem and spinal canal can lead to some autonomic dysfunction. But uh, as Dr. Luciano mentioned, we really don't know all of the ways in which uh, these things are connected. We've seen, uh, people have seen postural tachycardia syndrome uh, in those with syringomyelia, where you might think that they really just need more surgery, but this is a paper reminding us that you need to try the um, medication, uh, the medical management first. Uh, on the top, uh, you may be able to just pick out the period at which point this person develops syncope during their tilt test is about 15 minutes in, uh, and even though she had very impressive anatomic abnormalities, they just treated her with Flornef and Atenolol, and the bottom panel shows that her heart rate and blood pressure normalized. So you can, you, both, both possibilities are there. That is, surgery can help, or the medication management might uh, help what looks like an obvious surgical problem. Uh, another variant on this is a girl that we saw here who had been uh, healthy and active. She got uh, headaches and fatigue that fluctuated. Uh, headaches increased after six months and then she had her first syncopal episode. And at that point she was having continuous headaches and wasn't able to go to school. So when she was examined, she had nystagmus, she had an abnormal Romberg test and the MRI was obtained and that was consistent with the Chiari. And then uh, she had a nice resolution of the headache uh, th for three weeks after her Chiari surgery. And then she started getting a bit of a different headache, a duller uh, headache, both temples, as well as some what was called vertigo, uh, but um, uh, all of her vertigo tests were normal, so they thought she had migraines. She was tried on a number of migraine remedies including a low-fat diet, acupuncture, and a variety of the standard um, migraine medicines. But uh, by the time I saw her, she was having these headaches on most days, and they would start in the mid-morning, lasting all day, and they were um, worse when she was in a hot environment, worse if she was riding a car or a bus. Uh, she had lightheadedness only occasionally, but she would get these visual blackouts several times a day. And she didn't feel very sharp mentally. She was a good enough student that she could drop a fair bit and still be getting A's, but uh, she, didn't, she just didn't feel sharp. Uh, when I looked at her, she seemed a bit slow-paced in her responses verbally, but otherwise she was pretty normal. All of the abnormalities that had been seen with her Chiari were now gone. And she had some, uh, uh, she'd healed her scar well. She had a bit of neck muscle spasm and tightness. Uh, we did a standing test in the clinic, and this shows that she had a bit of fluctuation in her blood pressure in the blue. Heart rate went up uh, initially about 38 beats, and then at about the nine minute point, she absolutely had to sit down. She got really hot, had a worse headache nausea and her blood pressure dropped. Uh, we didn't get uh, the upright blood pressure. She was uh, supine when we found that she was, she'd dropped down to 88. Uh, so here's a person who's had a proper Chiari um, decompression but still is having these headaches. We identify orthostatic intolerance, treat her for the, head, for the orthostatic intolerance with extra salt, uh, Florin F. We did some PT for her muscle tightness 
and added a, another medication to help with uh, orthostatic intolerance and she had a very nice response. So she was somebody where the surgeons didn't need to worry then about surgical complications or leaks. It was really the, the orthostatic intolerance that was creating her headaches at this point. And she's now a medical student. So I, I'm just gonna end with a couple of the lessons about these interactions between Chiari and autonomic dysfunction. Uh, we know that the association with syncope is there. That's been known for a long time, but I wanna emphasize that non-syncopal orthostatic intolerance can be an early manifestation of Chiari and cervical stenosis, we're finding, uh, sometimes with quite a protracted prodrome before the classic features of Chiari appear. Uh, the decompression and repair uh, of these abnormalities uh, can be associated with marked functional improvement and improvement in the heart rate and blood pressure responses to upright tilt. Uh, people ought to be alert to orthostatic headaches as a feature of orthostatic intolerance rather than a problem stemming from the neurosurgical repair. And then it may be that the shared risk factors for Chiari and orthostatic intolerance uh, could include connective tissue laxity. Dr. Frank Amano's written about the higher risk of Chiari in those with EDS. Uh, uh, joint hypermobility and EDS are risk factors for the orthostatic intolerance as well. So they're not always connected. They're, they're often connected, but not always. So I just wanted to thank those who've supported our work here over the last uh, 20 some years. And uh, Dr. Brinker, I think, is up next. <laughs>